This morning we're going to be partaking of the Lord's Supper together. It's the ordinance that the Lord of the church instituted on the night in which he was betrayed for our good. And so I pray that we'll be blessed and encouraged as we remember his death together as the body of Christ in this ordinance. <clears throat> I want to be praying for Don Crone. He's a brother of mine and has been attending this church for many years and his only grand uh, son passed away and uh, it was rather suddenly and if we could all just be praying and reaching out to him uh, during this time and we'll be doing a service here in the next week or so. So let's pray and then we will open the word of God and keep worshiping. Father, I thank you for Joe. I thank you for you. I thank you that you are a God who saves and changes and sanctifies and we, we can't even get in the way of the process, Lord, that uh, you brought Joe, crushed him, and just um, humbled pride. I thank you that you're opposed to the proud and you give grace to the humble. I thank you for the abundant grace that is now flowing through our brother in Christ. Lord, our hearts are full and made glad with your tender mercies toward Joe Steffens. God, I thank you now that we get to open the word of God. And I pray that you would come and you would attend it and that our hearts would be overtaken Jesus Christ. God put him on display in all of his glory. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'll turn to Romans chapter 6, we're going to continue our study through Romans. We began the theme of this book, Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God to bring salvation. And we're just seeing what a thorough salvation it is as we keep studying through Romans. Uh, it's a salvation from the wrath of God. God came to save us from God. He came to deliver us from the wrath that was on us because of sin. And we've seen that this gospel takes care of the penalty. We, we get Adam's guilt and our own guilt, and the penalty is the soul that sins must die. Jesus Christ comes and dies on a cross in our place. And then we've been looking at sin's power, is that it, it, it ruled and reigned when Adam sinned. And the sin comes now as Joe was testifying, and it breaks the power of canceled sin. And it begins to deliver us and change us and transform us from one image of glory to the next. And the hope of every believer, why we gather here every Sunday, is one day we're going to be delivered from sin's very presence and we have an amazing hope. That's where all this is moving. I pray it's your hope. I pray your hope is not a better America, but your hope is one day to no longer sin again. You won't even be able to sin. All of us will be free from it to worship God forever. That is where this train is going, and I pray that your hearts are full looking for that day. What a salvation. And, and Romans is saying there's a certainty. Salvation does not abort. It doesn't come short. It doesn't fail. When God puts his grace upon you, he will finish it, and you will end up in glory, and you will be there forevermore, guaranteed by the power of God. We're currently in chapter 6. Get comfortable. We're going to be in it for a few months. For the longest time, the church, in my estimation, needed to iron out justification. You needed to understand how to get right with God and how to rest in that and to look fully and completely in the finished work of Christ. And we labored hard in that truth and, and prayed that God would shed his love abroad in your hearts. And now I'm just sensing such a need for the understanding of sanctification. That's how do I grow into conformity with Jesus Christ? And that's why we're slowing down and parking because we gotta get this and we need to understand how, do, how does God grow me? How can I become more like Jesus Christ? And so the, I just see it as so uh, needed. So I'm going to slow down the pace that we might understand how can I grow in Christ. So if you'll look with me, we're in chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. Here's the outline that we've been going through is that Paul's given us five truths concerning our release, and catch that word, from the dominion of sin, from the rule of sin from when we were lost. And the first point we looked at verse 1 was an antagonist. <clears throat> what should we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? And so it's such a beautiful salvation. This, this gospel is salvation is received, not achieved. There's no other religion that teaches that. 
It's a gospel that begins with acceptance. You don't go earn it and get acceptance. You begin accepted by God, saved, and loved. There's no other gospel like it. It's just so radical and different from the teaching of our world. And it causes some to say, well, why don't we just live any way we want then? We'll just sin and let grace abound. How does a message like that change you and transform you? And Paul's been answering that really, really well. Our second point, here's the answer, the axiomatic truth. How can you, who, how shall we, I'm sorry, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? How can you who, who died to that old nature, that old station that used to rule and reign your life, don't you know you died to that? It's an heiress, past tense, it's done. You died to that old rule and dominion in your life. <clears throat> and then the argument begins in verses 3 through 10, and that's where we've gotten kind of stuck, but I got good news. We finish the argument this week, and then next week we'll look at what is our attitude. You need to reckon it. And then in verses 12 through 14, we're going to look at the application of what we've been learning. What does that look like day to day and practically once I know this? So let's take up again verses 3 through 10. Or do you not know? <clears throat> Paul brings us to what happened by faith when you believe this gospel. And when you believed, you were, the Greek word is baptizo, you were immersed and you were joined into Jesus Christ. You've been married to him. You now have a union, a mystical union with Christ. And this is how it all works. He is the fount of every blessing. Everything flows from Christ. He doesn't just throw something at you. He joins you to him and you receive the fullness of Christ. And when you're joined to him, it says you died with Christ when he died. And when he was buried, you were buried. And when he was raised, you were raised. That's Paul's argument. And Paul, as true to form, is going to take those simple principles, these indicatives, these statements of fact. This is what happened. You don't do it. It's been done for you. And he's going to flush them out. And we began last week looking at verses 5 through 7, that we died <coughs> to sin. And this morning we'll look at verses 8 through 10, that you were made alive to God. And so look with me in verse 6, where we were last time, knowing this. That our old self, what you were in Adam, what you were as an unbeliever, was crucified with Christ. It died. In order that the body of sin, when sin ruled and reigned, and it took your members and used it to sin against God and to be the devil's lackey, the body of sin might be rendered inoperative, not uh, annihilated. We still have remaining sin, but we don't have reigning sin any longer for the purpose that we should no longer be slaves to sin. And so this gospel sets us free from the slavery that we all once lived in, where sin ruled and reigned and called all the shots. This gospel of Jesus Christ can break that and set the prisoners free. And so there are two kinds of people in this world. There are those who are dead in sin and those who are dead to sin and its awful rule in our lives. And now this morning, if you'll look with me in verse 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that you have been made alive to God in Christ Jesus. This life that we are joined to in Christ gives life and it gives salvation. And I want you to hear this. It gives you strength to live today the Christian life. And so I want you to grow in this knowledge and realization of our union with Christ. A good marriage is you grow in it. And as you grow in it, there's a fruit that just grows up, and you've been united to Christ by faith. And if you take Christ out of Christianity, as Pastor Rutland was sharing this morning, you, you lose it all. It's, it's all of Christ. That's why he is put on display. It's him. There's salvation and no other name under heaven. And the old realm that we all lived in when we were unsaved in sin, we died to it, and we've been taken out of it. And we're brought into a new realm where now Christ rules 
and it brings a newness of life. The gospel is not go morally clean up, fix yourself up, quit doing bad things and do good things. It's to come to Jesus Christ and to be taken out of what you once were and to be raised to walk in newness of life from the inside to the out. There's no other power except this gospel that can deliver from the bondage of sin. And so if you're here this morning and you've been battling sin your whole life and religion and morality isn't changing your heart, what I'm offering to you is a gospel that can. And so there's hope. There's hope, as you just heard. And I want you to come with me and look at this beautiful answer. So how do you feel when you live like the old you? And so what I pray is that every believer is, what happens is, is you, you can't go back to what you were in Adam. You can still sin and do some of the things you used to do, but to go back to that old station where you're at peace and you're at home with sin and you love it and you live it and you give your members to it and it, you just can't get enough of it and you thirst for it, is, 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 is you can't go back to that. And if that's who you are, your need isn't to work a little harder, it's salvation. But every believer should sit here and say, amen, amen, amen. I'm not what I should be, could be, or ought to be, but because of Christ, I'm not the same. I, I, I just, I can't live and think and be at home and, and go back to what I was in Adam. I've died to that. It's a message that needs to be proclaimed from the housetops. I have flesh that still wants to sin. I have flesh that still desires pleasures. But I cannot be at home as I once was in sin any longer. You can't live in two realms. And that is what Christianity in America is crying out for. This dead, alive to God. And I pray that your soul is crying out for that. And this morning, what we're going to look at is resurrection life that has been given to us in Christ. You have resurrection life abiding in you this morning. So come with me to verse 8. <clears throat> now if, that's what's known in the Greek as a first class condition. We've seen several in Romans and it's a condition of reality. So you would translate it since. So this is believer since, since we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also shall live with him. We believe that. That shall also, that we, we've died, but we believe that we're also going to live with this Christ. I love this. We believe this by faith and we trust it. We bank our lives on it. We believe that Christ lived, died, was buried, and raised. It's the whole foundation of Christianity. We believe that. Easter Sunday, he's risen. And we all yell, he's risen indeed. Why? Because we believe that with all of our hearts and all of our lives. We are fully persuaded that Christ rose from the dead and we shall live with him. And what's interesting here is it's in the future tense. So it forces you to make a decision here. Is Paul talking about a future resurrection or is he talking about the resurrection of our Christian life right now? So what's the answer? And we've talked about this several times. I want to make sure when I use this phrase, you know what I'm talking about. The already, not yet. The already is that you, you by faith, you, you died and you were buried and you've been raised to walk in newness of life right now. And there's a day coming when God's going to finish this salvation where he'll remove the presence of sin. So the not yet is we're waiting for that final part where all sin is removed and we're all battling and struggling with it right now. So there is no doubt that this includes our future resurrection. That's where Paul's going to move this whole argument in Romans chapter 8. But if you stay in the context and the flow of what Paul is arguing, remember what I said, it's indicatives. And indicatives are statements of facts of what God has done. What has been done to us in Jesus Christ presently. <clears throat> so to reckon what is true about you right now when you by faith are joined to Jesus Christ. And so the question is, why throw that in a future tense? And the way Paul is presenting this is that our co-death with Christ and our co-resurrection with Christ so that right now we can walk in newness of life. The future tense can be seen this way. It's certain that we died with Christ and it's certain that now your future life, what comes up the next day and the day after is a life with union with Christ, which is life. I'm the resurrection and the life. You're joined to him and you have that life and power 
right now and in the future. You're alive to God. You are alive to a future of walking with Jesus Christ in the newness of life. So then, since we have died with him, the consequence of a life of living with Christ and the new life with him. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live. But the life I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I want us as a church to live by faith in the presence and the power and the life of Jesus Christ. To be conformed to his image to do the work that he's given to us as the church of God and the great commission. So he's given us himself, I'll be with you always, and power. In in the New Testament, over a hundred times to be in Christos, you're put in Christ. And guys, there's there's resurrection life. You, You surely died to sin and you were buried and you've been raised with the resurrection life of Jesus Christ. So what is our problem? We forget it. Paul keeps saying, knowing, 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 remember. And the, and the reality is, is we forget it. And we start looking at our remaining sin and we start looking at the world and, and we forget and we start feeling like, I'm never gonna grow, I can't grow. These sins are gonna own me my whole life. And Paul's telling us, you gotta remember these realities and, you, and next week you gotta wreck them. You gotta get them in your heart and you need to come to the communion table And remember again what Christ has done to give us resurrection life. And so the church is we fight together to keep our faith and our trust in Christ. We're we're a community all working together. And it's not fancy or exciting and flashing lights, but it's all of our lives joined together, reminding you in everything. Look again at Christ. Look what we have in Christ. Don't you know? You've died to that. You don't have to live in that any longer. You've been made new. There's power in Christ to overcome these sins. I I can't tell you what I've witnessed this week in some conversions of the power of God from things that no one can break out of. It's a power that I can't get over. I know why Paul wasn't ashamed of this gospel. It is the power to save, and it can save from sin. The most forgotten thing in Christianity is Christ. No, you never go away from him. My son, when the pandemic hit, he lost sports. He, he was really into sports. He loved watching even college basketball, like teams in the East and all these things. And, and, he, and all that was shut down. We lost March Madness. And then he had to come home from work. Uh, church all of a sudden is taken away and it's a live stream and then he's trying to get married and every wedding venue keeps closing down on him and shutting down and then he's trying to buy a house in the middle of all this stuff and they're offering like $50,000 over market and, and, and then um, a health thing hits him and his heart is it's just beating so bad the kid can't even stand up. Like it's just, he's so weak and dizzy he can't, it's just too much for him, and he can't coach basketball anymore, and um, to, you can't get into doctors. The, the weight is unbelievable, so all of a sudden, how do I journey this? And I texted him, and I just said, son, how, how you doing? And he said, my body's really doing bad, but my faith has never been better. He said, I have Christ. <laughs> it's that simple. I got Christ. If you take away everything, and I'm just going to use a simple illustration that if if you can't relate to this, you've been dead for the last year, 2020. And if you have nothing left after 2020, you've missed the whole thing. You don't have Christianity. I see some that you're done, you're bitter, you're frustrated, or suicidal. And I see others, you're like a little spring flower in bloom, man, from 2020. The more that was taken away, the more you've realized the value of Jesus Christ and the more it's purged what your real hope is and that you're a citizen of another country. 
And I've just been watching what God is doing. It's been fascinating. Which one are you? This is the life that God offers to us. You're married to the answer, to the hope, the life, and the power that we can walk in newness of life. The opposite of those who are dead in sin. The possibilities that are before us this morning are amazing. I feel like we settle far too short for what God could do through us. Instead of breaking it with pride and damming it up, to, to let resurrection power, like you have the power of Jesus Christ to go live the life that he's called for. What, what the world could be changed by this assembling right here. Resurrection power to go love your wife, to go be patient with your children and teach them about Jesus again and again and again, to live in your singleness. And all the things that God's asking of you, there is resurrection power. It's unbelievable. So my application before we even begin is we need to make this a habit every day. God, thank you. I'm dead to sin. And I'm alive to you. We would live so different if we lived into this reality daily. It would change your lives to get up every day and reckon this to be true. And we'll, we'll dig into that next week. But our foundation is, is Christ. And what I'm learning is I can trust him in everything and anything. He is so trustworthy and he is going to give me a, a power through this gospel and relationship to endure all things to the very end until I finally get him. And, and, and I'm going I'm to hold on to him and never let go when I get to glory. He's going to get sick of me. Verses 9 through 10. Knowing that Christ, then, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over him. So here we are again, knowing, <clears throat> knowing. God wants you to understand this and get it. Labor in the word of God. It's been long in Romans 6, I get it. But you need to master this and know it. Christ was raised from the dead, I'm certain of it. It's true. And know it and believe it and reckon it. He is risen. What would that do for just some of you this morning to just believe he really is risen? He brought salvation. And now it says he's never to die again. One scholar brought up the idea that Paul is referencing pagan religions of the day. And they, they had a deity that would have life and death cycles. And they would die and be reincarnated and just keep going. Live, die, live, die. And here's the stark contrast. Christ died once for all. Once. And he was raised Never to die again. Jesus Christ will never die again. He's just raised now as the source of life. Lazarus, raised from the dead, he had to die again. But not Christ. Hebrews says he has the power of an indestructible life. He's been raised and he lives. John sees Christ again on Patmos and he looks a little bit different. The resurrected Christ, and he falls at his feet as a dead man in Revelation 1. John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, do not be afraid. <laughs> How? I'm the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and the keys of Hades. South side, Jesus has been raised from the dead, never to die again. And by faith, I am joined to that life, eternal life. Death no longer is master over him. It's a very interesting phrase. I'd have never thought anything mastered Jesus, right? What had mastery over the sovereign ruler of the world? But Paul, led by the Spirit, tells us at some point, death had mastery over him. It, 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 but it doesn't any longer. So the implication is at some point, death had a reign over Jesus. It had mastery. So what is it talking about? Well, let's go back to context. Romans 5, when sin entered the world through Adam, it says death spread to all men. Now all men die. Death ruled over all men, he said, because all sinned in Romans 5.12. In Romans 6, 23, he ends it with the wages of sin is death. Sin brings death. But if Jesus never sinned, 
How could death be master over him? Christ was born under the law. He became human. He entered into this realm. And he's now subject to this present evil age on this earth of sin and death by taking on a human body. And so Jesus felt its effects. He was hated and mocked and he was murdered. He felt the solicitations of temptation and yet never sinning. Jesus Christ lived under its consequences. He identified with humanity. And he came into sin, this realm. Why? To conquer it. What is the power of death and sin, he said, is the law. And so Jesus came to bear our sins. The soul that sins must die. He came to die for the penalty of sin. And thus death had master over him. And as he hung on that cross, he breathed his last and died. He was under death. Romans 3.21, but now he conquered death. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose the victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. And so he broke it. Death no longer has dominion over him. He went into it and he broke its jaws. He rendered inoperative the, him who had the power of death, the devil, it says in Hebrews 2. He broke it. He defeated it. In Christ, death is not a master any longer. And everyone who is joined to him has this resurrection life, an indestructible life in Christ. In verse 10, the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. Sin brought death. It had to be defeated. He died to sin. And everywhere else in Scripture, it says he died for sin. But here it says he died to sin and so Christ died to sin so that we who are tied to him by faith died to sin's penalty and its power and its dominion. And so Christ at the incarnation became human. He came into the realm and rule of sin. Again, he felt it all, but he never yielded to its rule and power. He was a better Adam. This Adam would not sin. He conquered it. He received its guilt. He paid its wages. He became sin for us. And he took that sin into a grave. And he had a final dealing with it. And when he rose, he left sin in the grave, defeated and conquered. He's done with it. And when he appears a second time, it says he will appear for salvation, not in reference to sin. Sin is done. He died to it once. It's now salvation. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. So the end of conflict with sin, the life that follows now is a life devoted to the service of God and his kingdom. On earth, he lived in the realm of sin with the purpose of defeating uh, sin and its rule. He identified with sinners. We'd, he died on our behalf. He was raised, and now his life is beyond the realm of sin. He's no longer putting away sin. It's finished once and for all. It's been paid. It's done. And now he just solely lives to God. His death, as John Owen said, was the death of death. His resurrection, I believe. And he had victory over sin and death. That now we can live in a new age free from sin and death. To be sitting here this morning free from the fear of death. Free, there, he, he, he broke its jaws and free from the rule and reign of sin. By faith we are joined to his life and that's a life devoted to God. The power of this gospel I died to what I was in Adam, and now I'm alive in Christ to live for what Christ lives for, the glory of his Father and nothing else.
If you have a death sentence in this world, you die in an electric chair or lethal injection. But you, you justif- you're justified because what you had to do was die for your penalty, your, your sin. You can't go live as a justified person, can you? It's done. Over. But the Christian dies and he's made alive to go live as a justified person. I get to go live now as one who's been fully pardoned and made free in Christ. Wesley said, our eyes diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. We can live to God. That's the gift of the gospel. I'm free to live to God. And one day, and the not yet, I will live with God. And so I pray, saints of God, the resurrection life that we have in Jesus Christ. Next week, we are going to spend the whole week then applying this. You got to start reckoning this to be true. You got to quit believing lies and believe what God says is true. And I'm going to live into this. And I've died to what I was in Adam. And I now live in resurrection life. And so what is capable of what God can do in and through us. There's no end to it because I'm joined to resurrection life in Jesus Christ. Don't ever look at me and say, I can't. He is able. He is able. And we want to start learning that. How do we live into resurrection life? I want to live. I'm just tired of defeated lives of despair, sorrow. There's just something that God's offering that I'm just praying for this whole body to see and believe and reckon and live into. Live, live into who you are. Go live as a justified believer. And so as we go to the table, I'm a few minutes late, and I, I think Joe's first act of kindness after what God has done is to buy anyone lunch who's upset that we went late. <laughs> <laughs> Nursery workers, let them all know Joe's treating. As we go to the table, to remember then these great and amazing truths, of the one who died on a cross and he was buried and, and he was raised and now is endowed with salvation. I want to set the table one last time before we begin. We spent a year on justification and it's how you can be made right with God, how the God of the universe can say you're not guilty before him. And some of you were like, get on already, pastor. And now that we're talking about sanctification, how do I live the Christian life? The first thing you do is you throw out your foundation. I spent a year laying this foundation of justification by faith in Christ alone. It's the the church lives or stands on it. Your life lives or stands on it. And the minute you start thinking about sanctification, you throw it out. I've already heard some of you. Wait a minute, I still have sin. You know, I did some of the things I used to do when I was in Adam. I can't be a Christian. Stop. Therefore, I'm thinking of marriage. Now, this illustration of, you know, so let's just say, I'm going to use Joe because he, he already kind of got up here and used himself as an example. Let's say you, you work hard, you start a business, service master, and you, you work hard and, and, and all these years of laboring and doing everything you can, and you become very rich, and you become a millionaire, and you make all this money. How'd you do it? Blood, sweat, and tears. And let's say you meet a woman then and you fall in love and you marry her. And, and, and this could be the other way around. So ladies, don't be upset with me. Okay? You meet a woman, you fall in love and marry her. And now she's rich. <laughs> How? By legal union. She didn't have blood, sweat, and tears. She just said, I do. And by faith, you're joined to Jesus Christ is my illustration. It's called grace. All that Jesus did all that he accomplished on earth, it can be legally true of you when you believe and you're married to him. God really looks at you as if you died the death on that cross that your sins deserved and that you live the life that Jesus lived. His past is mine. His medal of honor is pinned on me. God looks at me as if I did everything Jesus did. I'm a hero. 
The Father delights in me as if I have done everything that his son did. That's your foundation. That's your hope. As we move into sanctification, you're going to live on that and build on that and not throw it out the second you battle with sin. Last illustration, and we'll go to the table. There's a movie called Saving Private Ryan. And I, 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 don't, I can't remember all the details anymore. It's been so long. But it was this, this guy lost, I think it was a couple brothers, and they were trying to get him back because it was too many who had been killed in one family. But the part that stood out to me is at the end of the movie, <coughs> this whole battle's over to try to rescue him. And Private James Ryan stands up in the middle and he walks over to Captain John Miller. And John Miller was mortally wounded and he's laying there dying. And he had given his life to save Private Ryan. And he pulls him close and he says, James, earn this. Earn it. And then he dies. And the final scene of the movie, Private Ryan is now an old man. And he's standing at Captain John Miller's grave and it's so moving he says with tears as he's speaking to his grave, I remember what you said to me every day, and I hope that, that at least in your eyes, I earned what all of you men did for me. And so many do this in the Christian life. Romans 1 through 5, Jesus never says, earn this. We're going to come to a table, and he doesn't say, earn what I did by hanging on a cross. For you. We never say to him, I hope that at least in your eyes, Jesus, I've earned what you've done for me. The freeness of this gospel is he's done it all and he offers it freely to you. That is the foundation that me dying to sin takes place. And the cross is looked at with the eyes of faith and it is finished and he offers the salvation freely to everyone who will believe. And when I look at this and remember this morning, this is what makes me dead to sin when I believed. I, I, I couldn't go on living the way I did when I didn't see the glory and the beauty of what Christ did for me. And now my heart is alive to God. How did it become alive looking and believing at the cross of Jesus Christ? Can you look at the cross and not be alive to God? I'm so alive to him. And that's what we're going to remember right now as you look at this cross. It, you should just be alive to love this God, and here are my members, to serve you, Jesus Christ. Don't go back to trying to live a life to earn what he did for you. Live into the fullness that you are justified and accepted, you measure up to specs, and you are loved by God. Reckon it to be so this morning. So let me pray, and then we're going to pass out the elements, and we are going to remember the beauty of what Christ has done to redeem a bride for himself. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this gospel. I thank you that it's so beautiful. It brought about a death. God, the life when I did not know Christ was a life of sin. And I was a do loss. I loved it. I served it freely and willingly. Oh God, thank you for a death that now the most grievous thing I do is sin. God, what could change a heart like that but you? And you took me in a grave and I died with Christ and have been raised to walk in newness of life. God, let that be true of every heart in here. That we are alive to God as Jesus Christ is done with sin and alive to serve and glorify his Father for all of eternity. God, let us join in the Son's service to you. God, thank you for this power of an indestructible life. And I thank you that the one who believes in him shall live even if he dies. God, thank you that we have been tied to an indestructible life and, and we will never die. God, thank you for these souls that shall live forever with you. Thank you for such a gospel. Thank you for your son. And we boast only in Christ. He alone is our hope and our foundation and our plea. God, I love him and I thank you for our sweet Savior. Bless our time now as we remember him together by faith. And it's in his name that we do pray. Amen.